Hi everyone, it's a beautiful Friday afternoon in Gainesville here. We wish we could be together. This is our second Zoom Barraza, Friday the 18th of September, and we have one of our own, Dr. Philip Jansen, who is an assistant professor of African history at UF with us. He holds a PhD from University of Wisconsin-Madison from 2018, and he's just starting his second year here at Florida. He teaches courses on Africa and the Atlantic world, um, courses such as Africa and world history, a new course, empires, nationalism, and revolution, as well as the history practicum in his home department. He's published in the Canadian Journal of African Studies, in social history, and in a journal called The Americas, a quarterly journal of Latin American history. This is an indication of the breadth of his work, which spans Africa and the wider Atlantic world, including Latin America. He's currently working on a book that explores um, the operations of colonial administrators in West and Central Africa who came from the Caribbean region um, around questions of race and nation, um, investigating things such as the intellectual networks that they created. So we're really looking forward to this book and hearing about his research this afternoon. His talk today is called Reforming, Deforming, Unforming, Poetry and Geography in Atlantic World History. Thanks for being with us here today. Thanks, Brenda. And thanks, Todd, for setting this all up. Um, as, as Brenda mentioned, I'm in the history department here at UF, uh, but today I'm going to speak a lot more about poetry and geography, and those are subjects that I don't normally speak about, that I don't know enough or much about. Uh, so I am a bit concerned that the presentation today is going to become a bit convoluted. Um, so before that happens, before I make that happen, I want to start uh, with the three core ideas uh, of this presentation. The first uh, of those three is uh, an idea that many of you studied, many of you write about, uh, the idea that colonialism imposed geography. Uh, of course, colonialism imposed many things, uh, political systems, economic models, uh, social structures, languages, uh, you can continue on and on. But colonialism also imposed geography. It imposed uh, ways of thinking about space. Um, colonizers created borders and roads. And they named or renamed villages, towns, lakes, and rivers. Uh, they relocated people and settlements. Um, so this imposition of geography or, or territoriality is sometimes a term people use. This transformed how people thought about space. Um, so that's the first idea, that this imposition of, of colonial geographies. The second idea, as I'm trying to make this keep the wheels on here, uh, the second idea is that colonial geographies have endured in many ways. Um, I don't want to argue that they were all encompassing, certainly they were not, um, but they have endured. Colonial borders, capitals, roads, the examples I mentioned earlier, um, and these colonial geographies, they've also endured in scholarship. Uh, historians of, of colonialism have used and reproduced colonial geographies for decades uh, in our field research and the narratives that we create, uh, myself included. Um, we're doing research in Dakar and Paris, in Accra and London. Uh, even this idea of, of studying colony and metropole in a single analytical framework. Um, how, many, how many academic ships has that idea launched in the last 20 years? Um, you know, 20 years ago, that was really a breakthrough, a new, a new avenue, but from 2020, it's easy to see how that, that framework forecloses so much. So that's the second idea. First idea is colonialism imposed geography. Second idea that these imposed or colonial geographies have endured and they often inform the frameworks through which we create knowledge. So the third idea is really more of a question, I suppose. Um, if scholars are reproducing these colonial geographies, and I'm, I'm saying that we are, um, 
in some cases. Um, if scholars are reproducing these colonial geographies, then what are we missing? What are, what are we overlooking? Uh, what about the cognitive maps that were not replaced by the territoriality of colonial rule? What about the ideas about place and space uh, that were owed little to colonial geographies? And what about people who imagined alternatives? Uh, how can historians and other scholars, for that matter, uncover those kinds of perspectives? So that, that third idea, you know, these questions, that group of questions, that's the focus of my, my presentation today. Um, that people living under colonial rule grappled with colonial geographies and imagined alternatives. And so how can scholars be more conscious of those ideas, of those ways of thinking? I'm certainly not the first person to propose this kind of thing. Um, when I think about geography and, and Africanist scholarship, there's a book from 2002 by Christopher Gray on territoriality in Gabon. Uh, more recently, there's been a wave of, of scholarship on, on making the world after empire, uh, the, the afterlives of Bandung and so on. Um, but my modest suggestion here today is that I think scholars ought to pay more attention more specific attention to geography, um, to imagined geographies as an integral part of decolonization. And that's where I suppose I come to these three strange verbs in the title of my paper. Uh, you never quite know how a title of a paper is gonna be uh, sound until someone else reads it and you think, hmm, maybe I shouldn't have used those words, but here we are. Um, reforming, deforming and unforming. I'm using those words to describe some of the ways uh, that, that people have reckoned with colonial geographies. And I'll try and put a bit more meat on those terms as I, as I move through the talk. Um, but for now, I'll say, you know, when I think about reforming, I think about something that changed, that, a kind of change that retains the same raw material. Deforming also retains that same raw material, uh, but it's more, perhaps more violent. It, it renders an original into a form that is hardly recognizable, deformed. And then we get to unforming. Unforming as, as both total destruction on one hand and new creation. It, it sort of refers to both the breaking down, the unforming of something, um, but it also gestures to, to things that have yet to be formed, to possibilities that have yet to take shape, things that are unformed. Uh, and I'm drawing on other scholars here, a slew of other scholars, uh, geography scholars that I'm just barely getting into here, uh, Catherine McKittrick and Michelle Stephens, foremost among them, some literary scholars, uh, Brent Edwards and Lisa Lowe have written about geography in this way. Um, but I'm also pulling from the work of two, two Caribbean writers, Emé Césaire and Kamal Brathwaite, and now we get to see if I can pull up the slides of prepared. I think I can, here we are. That's a lot of text on one slide. I assure you that the, the whole presentation is not like that. Um, but I do want to dwell or sit with these two excerpts um, for a little bit. And I'll, let, I'll pause a little bit and let you read through them. So it's hard to gauge uh, how many of you have read through them or not when you're, when you're in Zoom, but I'll, I'll assume you have. Um, in both these passages, Césaire and Brathwaite identify the, the destructive power of colonial geographies. Uh, they, they see broken islands. They see islands that are deformed, uh, shredded, and skewered. They see islands that are scars and wounds and catastrophe. But on the other hand, Césaire and Brathwaite are also imagining geographical coherence. 
And they both identify this as their challenge. They both use this word. They will, they will not be prevented in this challenge by reason. Uh, they are casting together these islands. They are spanning the spaces in between these islands. Uh, they're imagining a unified whole. It's the word that Brathwaite uses. And this is where I thought things would start to be getting convoluted. So if you're feeling like this is getting convoluted, you're, we're in the same boat. Um, so let me restate that question I raised earlier. How can scholars be more conscious of the ways that people living under colonial rule imagine alternatives to colonial geographies? The contours that, that Césaire and Brathwaite are suggesting here they offer a very different model for studying history. In my case today, I'm gonna to focus on Atlantic world history, but you can think about this in any number of contexts. They're offering a very different model for studying history. It's not colony metropole, it's not the nation state, it's not island-based or continent-based. It's something else, it's an alternative model and a model that I think is quite useful um, for tracing these kinds of imagined alternative geography. So, for the rest of this talk, this presentation, I want to try and make all of this a little bit more concrete um, by telling the story of a much lesser known writer uh, and the poems that he wrote, someone much lesser known than Césaire and Brathwaite. And his name was Henri Jean-Louis. There he is. And I'll get to the nickname Jean-Louis Baggio uh, later on. I'll start, before I get into the, his poems, I'll, I'll start with a sketch of his life. He was born in St. Anne, Guadeloupe uh, in 1874. He studied law in Paris and then returned to the Caribbean where he worked as a lawyer and as a judge, uh, both in Guadeloupe as well as in Martinique. Then in 1923, things, his career is shaken up a little bit. The French Minister of Colonies appoints Jean-Louis as a judge in Brazzaville, the capital of French Congo. Jean-Louis's position as a, an Antillian administrator, a judge in Africa was not entirely unique. As Brenda mentioned at the beginning, the, the larger project I'm working on uh, is about French and British Caribbean administrators who came from the Caribbean and worked in West and Central Africa um, between about 1880 and 1940. There are about 500 other figures, similar figures to Jean-Louis. Um, as Brenda said, those stories are the focus of the larger project today, focusing on, on Henri Jean-Louis. So he's appointed, he's a judge and a lawyer, uh, he's appointed to, to Brazzaville. After two years there, colonial authorities transferred him to Madagascar. Uh, but instead of following orders and taking up this appointment, he resigned uh, his position, but he also stayed in Central Africa, he began working as a lawyer, and began developing a number of political networks uh, with other lawyers, with other activists, politicians. Uh, one, I mean, I won't go over all the details here, but during this time, one thing he did was submit a number of petitions to the League of Nations on behalf of a group of chiefs uh, making land claims in Cameroon. He also made uh, frequent trips between Brazzaville and Paris uh, and Cameroon and Senegal, uh, building up networks. He joined several Pan-Africanist groups in Paris uh, in the 1930s, early 1930s. And these networks between, between Brazzaville and Douala and Dakar and Paris, they laid the groundwork uh, for the rest of his political life and, and sowed the seeds, if you will, for his, his later ideas about decolonization. In 1933, so 10 years after his first appointment to French Congo, in 1933, Jean-Louis returned to Guadeloupe. And to me, that's where his story really gets interesting, because that's when he starts writing all these poems, uh, a lot of poems. Now, from 1933 until his death in 1958, he wrote 30 or 40 poems every year, sometimes a lot more, sometimes less. Uh, for the most part, they're very short. They're, they're very simple, you know, A, B, cat, bat, hat kind of rhyming style. Um, there's an almost, pardon me, and almost none of them were ever published. Um, but they are still a remarkable set of sources. Um, for one thing, he, Jean-Louis always wrote the name and the date, or pardon me, the place and the date uh, 
the date and the place from where he was writing from. So you can trace his physical trajectory through all these poems. Um, but obviously the poems reveal more than where he was. They also reveal what he was thinking. They reveal his ideas about the French empire, about decolonization and about geography, which is the point I'm gonna hammer on today. So the poems not only give you a sense of his physical trajectory, but also his, his intellectual trajectory. Now, as I mentioned, none of these poems were ever published. So before I get into some examples, um, I should say a few words about the collection itself. At the, the Université des Antilles, or the, the University of the Antilles in, in Martinique, there's a scholar of Caribbean literature named Charles Scheele. Uh, and he's done a ton of research on a novelist named Victor Jean-Louis, who's the son of Henri Jean-Louis, who you're looking at. And over the years, Shield became very close with the Jean-Louis family, uh, with Victor Jean-Louis as well. Um, and so when Victor Jean-Louis died, the family invited Shield over to the old Paris apartment uh, to look through some of Victor Jean-Louis, the son, to look through some of Victor Jean-Louis old papers, uh, manuscripts, to see if there was anything of, of interest. So they're looking through this, uh, this old storage unit of his apartment in Paris. Uh, and among the various many boxes and papers, uh, there was an old suitcase. And in it was something Shield was not expecting, nor was the family expecting. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of poems written by Victor Jean-Louis' father, Henri Jean-Louis. Um, so I should say I'm, I'm indebted to both to Sh Charles Shield and to the Jean-Louis family for letting me read through uh, this collection, which is currently in, in the archives in, in Martinique. So, can I have a glass of water? <clears throat> so for the poems themselves, without further ado, I'll begin with a poem uh, called Assimilation from 1935. And here, I won't go through every detail of every poem. I just wanna give you sort of a sketch of, of this these intellectual trajectory I've been discussing. So in this poem, Jean-Louis calls for the immediate assimilation of Antillians and Africans into France. Now, 1935 was the 300th anniversary of the, quote, attachment of Martinique and Guadeloupe with France. But Jean-Louis was not blindly promoting uh, assimilation into France with, with no understanding of what had happened in, the, the, in those 300 years. In the poem, he calls for an end to the perverse regime, what he calls the perverse regime of colonial rule. And he demands an assimilation into France on an equal basis, something that would, quote, make all French people sons of the same mother. Um, if you study French colonialism or colonialism generally, you know the, the word assimilation is, is, for a long time, was associated so strongly with, with French colonialism. So here he's subverting that word a little bit. Um, in, and in, similarly, in another poem from that era, he suggests that France should transform its empire into an allied confederation, uh, making its colonies into dominions, much like Canada, New Zealand, Australia, in relation to Britain at that time. Uh, Jean-Louis argued that this, this assimilation into France would create, quote, a genuine society of free people instead of, quote, a vague and powerless Société des Nations, at the heart of which the strong devour the weak. So this was certainly a, a form of anti-colonialism, but it was expressed without recourse to nationalism. Um, thinking geographically, as I'm trying to do, Jean-Louis was suggesting a way of reforming the French Empire into a more equitable union, not getting rid of it, but reforming it. This sort of anticipates some of what happens after the Second World War. But here Jean-Louis is thinking about this in the 30s. A couple of years later, 1937, Jean-Louis moves to Trinidad briefly. Um, and his criticisms, pardon me, his criticisms of colonialism become a little bit more pointed. It was also at this time, uh, it seems, that he met Marcus Garvey. And so Charles and I have, Charles Shield, the scholar and I, we've only found one letter from Garvey to, to Jean-Louis. It's fairly mundane. So it's unclear exactly what their, their interactions were. 
Um, but it is clear that Garvey's Pan-Africanism had a major impact on Jean-Louis. Um, at the end of one poem, this long undrafted you know, speech about Garvey, he scrawls this quick poem, which I'll bring up here. Uh, you can, might be able to make out some of it. Um, he says, God save our savior, long live our savior, God save Garvey. Send him victorious, happy, and glorious, long to reign over us. God save Garvey. Now, this was a direct subversion of the anthem of the British monarchy, God save the king or God save the queen. Jean-Louis, however, had turned this anthem, had subverted this anthem into a pro-Garvey hymn. And this was a sign of, of things to come, an indication of his, his thinking, of Jean-Louis' thinking, drawing on the forms of empire, in this case, the form of an anthem, uh, but radically altering the content. During the Second World War, I'll jump ahead a little bit here, uh, Jean-Louis moved back to Guadeloupe, and by the end of the Second World War, his patriotism had worn off. Uh, he no longer saw a future within the geography of even a reformed French empire. For example, move to the next poem here. In November 1944, he wrote La Génie de Colombe, The Spirit of Columbus. And in it, you can't quite see this, the part I'm quoting from, maybe you can a little bit. Um, in it, Jean-Louis describes how Columbus had taken the whole globe as his colony and covered it with death. He had transformed the world into a volcano of hell. So here clearly Jean-Louis is moving away from any idea of reforming empire um, into what I'm calling deforming, a real attack on, excuse me, a real attack on the structure of the French empire and colonialism more generally, thinking back to Columbus. In another uh, particularly lively poem, uh, a couple of years later from March 1947, Jean-Louis declares, independence will put an end to the bloody and ruinous feast of the falcons of Europe. So clearly Jean-Louis' thinking had changed. Now, during the immediate post-war period, the French Empire itself began to reconfigure um, geographically and politically. And in the Caribbean, one, one result of this was departmentalization in Guadeloupe and Martinique and French Guyana, also in Reunion uh, off the east coast of, of Africa. This effort for departmentalization was led in part by Aimé Césaire, who I quoted earlier as a thinker, but here he's also, you have to remember, he was a politician, uh, the mayor of Fort de France in Martinique and the representative of Martinique in, uh, in the French National Assembly. And this effort at departmentalization uh, is always linked with Césaire. He had pushed for this um, to become you know, a province or an equal uh, département, an equal state or province in the French Republic, as opposed to a subjugated column. Um, now, this was this idea of departmentalization. This is exactly what Jean-Louis had been advocating for 10 years earlier in the 30s. But by the 1940s, by the time it's actually happening, he is resolutely against this position, resolutely against any kind of assimilation or departmentalization into the French Empire. And in 1949, in a, in a poem called Espérance, you can see part of it down here in the bottom, it says, come, the, the, the poem is written to a, an imagined angel of hope, he describes. And he says, come deliver the country, our families from assimilation, the disgrace of the nation, remove this lie, dreadful like a fantasy, change colonization to liberation. So Jean-Louis had clearly rejected this political geographical realignment of departmentalization. And it, here there's sort of a curious gap in, in, in Jean-Louis's uh, collection because there's no mention of Césaire anywhere, um, which is very curious because for an intellectual like Jean-Louis moving back and forth between Guadeloupe and Martinique in the 40s, um, Césaire would have been unavoidable. So it's a bit curious. Uh, I can say more about that later. Now Jean-Louis, with this rejection of departmentalization and these calls for independence, for immediate independence to, to end the ruinous feast of the falcons of Europe, he was also proposing 
new ideas about geography uh, and new ideas about the geography of decolonization. He did not believe in an independence that would create a bunch of atomized, independent states. Um, instead, at least in the context of the Caribbean, he called for an Antillean Union, an uh, Union Antillaise. In other words, Jean-Louis had changed from supporting this idea of a French confederation or a group of dominions. He had changed from supporting this idea of a French confederation to supporting a federation made up of the independent islands of the Caribbean, crossing the boundaries of empire, crossing boundaries of language. Doesn't, he's not only talking about Guadeloupe, Martinique, and French Guyana, he's talking about Trinidad, Jamaica, Grenada, everywhere else. Jean-Louis calls for a, a Union Antilles were a striking precedent to the efforts of West Indian politicians in the 1950s who did try to create a West Indian Federation, um, the leaders of Barbados and Jamaica and, and Guyana and Trinidad. So this was a striking precedent, but even more striking, and when you look into some of these poems, uh, were some of the geographical details of Jean-Louis' plan. For example, he suggested that the capital of this new Caribbean Union or Confederation, he suggested that the capital be named Del Greville, the, capi the capital des Andes, or the capital of the Antilles, the capital of the Caribbean. This was a reference to Louis Del Grey, who was the heroic leader in Guadeloupe of the rebellion against re-enslavement when Napoleon tried to reimpose and successfully did reimpose slavery in Guadeloupe and Martinique in the context of the Haitian Revolution. Del Grey had been a her the heroic leader um, fighting against the French, trying to, trying to maintain the ab abolition. So it's interesting first that, that Jean-Louis chooses Del Grey as, as the name, uh, as the leader, um, pardon me, chooses this leader as the, the namesake for his capital. But Jean-Louis also claims a personal link to Del Grey. He, he notes in a number of poems from this period, uh, from the late 40s and early 1950s, he notes in a number of poems that his great uncle had fought alongside uh, Louis Del Grey in order to defend the abolition of slavery in Guadeloupe and had been hanged by the French for his efforts. So in making this connection, that's personal connection, this political connection, Jean-Louis was also making a direct link between slavery and colonialism. And he was centering this history um, in a new deformed geography of the Caribbean. <clears throat> By the early 1950s, Jean-Louis' poems became even more imaginative. And they took on a more overtly Pan-Africanist tone. And it's here where Jean-Louis' ideas about geography and his ideas about decolonization move beyond reforming and deforming to what I'm calling unforming. He was dismantling entirely what existed and trying to imagine something new. For example, he began describing himself as the direct descendant of a man named Mohamed Baguio, who Jean-Louis claimed was the Pasha Sheikh of Timbuktu in the 15th century. Now likely Jean-Louis was referring to Mohamed Bagayogo, uh, who was a prominent scholar and sheikh in Timbuktu in the 16th century, and also a teacher of Ahmed Baba. There are probably a handful of people at least listening here today who know far more about uh, that period of, of Malian history in the Songhai Empire. Um, but Jean-Louis, it's significant, at least for right now, it's significant that Jean-Louis claimed that this ancestor, who he calls Mohammed Baguio, he says that this ancestor had tried to unite Arab and Black Africa, and he now pledged to fulfill the efforts of his ancestor. For example, in a poem from I'm jumping quite a ways ahead here to 1957, this poem, Espérance, Hope, he had stated, I will return to Africa, to my Black territory, to carve on its ancient soil a page of history. I will come last, me, Mohamed Baguio, to unify our Africa into a republic. So in some ways, he's not even just fulfilling the pledges of an ancestor or imagining these links. 
he is uh, suggesting is that he is a reincarnation uh, of Muhammad Bagayogo, this scholar from Timbuktu. Um, an interesting side note, you can see from, from this time period, uh, Jean-Louis was almost blind from cataracts. And so the, um, the writing on his, his scrawls of, of poems become a lot more difficult to decipher. Now, in other poems from this period, he takes up these same themes. He calls himself, quote, the Sultan of Black Africa. And he declares that he is going to lead a new confédération africo musulmane under a black, green, and red flag. So he's gonna become the leader of a new African Muslim confederation. And the flag he's mentioning, uh, black, green, and red, is the Garveyist Pan-Africanist flag. So these ideas continue to, to percolate. He also calls for, quote, the children of Africa to return to the continent and unify with Arabs into a republic against the European sharks. In the last two years of his life, Jean-Louis' poetic output became even more radical. And he seems to have taken influence from the 1955 Bandung Conference uh, and probably also from Ghana's independence in March 1957. And in addition to supporting and, and suggesting and calling for the creation of this African uh, Confederation or Republic, he also begin, begins promoting something new, an international socialist confederation between China, Russia, India, and this new Republic of Africa. For example, in this poem from June 1957, Peace and Fraternity, John Lee calls for this Republic of Africa to join with, quote, its brothers, China, Russia, and India, to form the Union of Socialist Nations. He claimed that this union would offer an alternative to the war mongering of France and England, and he references the war in Algeria and the Suez crisis. So as much as he's imaginative and, and you know, seemingly on another plane, he's also very much grounded uh, in what's going on in the world around him. They're, in, they're mixed in with the poems, there are news clippings from the Algerian war. Um, so his, his ideas remain grounded in, in the history. In another poem um, from 1957, The Union of Socialist Nations, he continues with these same ideas. He declares that this confederation of the Republic of Africa with China, Russia, and India, it will stand up against the, quote, capitalist bloc, the oppressors of workers and liberty, and it will bring, quote, peace and fraternity to the world. One of the last poems that Jean-Louis writes, and I'll stop with the onslaught of examples here. Um, one of the last poems that he wrote was titled The Revenge of Carthage on Rome. It's written in July 1958. By this point, as I mentioned, he was nearly blind. This is not even written by him. It's written by his daughter. Um, the poem was written while he was in hospital in St. Cloud in Guadeloupe. And the title is a reference to, to Hannibal's defeat of Rome. And in the poem, uh, Jean-Louis making, you can guess what the comparisons are. Jean-Louis calls for the, again, for the creation of the socialist union between Africa, India, China, and Russia. He says this union will govern the world and it will maintain peace in the vile countries by targeting the prejudices of race and nation that they call, alas, civilization. Some of the rhymes are a lot better in French, but that one sort of carries through. A little over a month later, this was July 1958, a little over a month later, Jean-Louis was dead. But this final reconceptualization of the world, um, to me, was as radical and imaginative as that of any anti-colonial thinker. Um, this was a, a geographical formation that was utterly apart from the French empire or any empire for that matter. It was based on humanity and socialism, uh, not on corruption or racism or exploitation or on slavery and violence. Jean-Louis' 
experiences with migration, uh, his interactions with people from around the world, the networks he had created, they led him to envision this alternative geography of decolonization. He had grown up in a time forged by slavery and by colonialism, but he unformed that history into a new model for the future. Now, I've mentioned already at the beginning and a few times here that almost none of Jean-Louis' poems were ever published. They sat in this suitcase for probably 35 years, uh, actually longer than that, maybe 45 years. So what's, why are they important? Uh, why are you spending your Friday afternoon listening to a bunch of poems that only a handful of people have ever, have ever read or thought about? What's the value in a collection of scribbled poems like this? To try to answer that, I want to come back to Césaire and to Brathwaite and this model I brought up at the beginning of, the, of my presentation. Uh, this model of thinking about history and geography, of spanning the distances between islands, of making connections across the gaps, across the in-betweens. Césaire and, and Brathwaite, as I mentioned, were imagining a world um, that existed outside the forms of colonial geographies. And so when I, when I read Jean-Louis' poems from this angle, I can't help but think about the many other stories, the many other people who imagined alternative geographies like Jean-Louis, but whose ideas, whose poems, whose other writings, they remain hidden or occluded by the afterlives of colonial geographies. And so to me, Jean-Louis' poems however obscure they are, these poems are a crucial reminder for scholars of colonialism to be more attentive to how the borders and frameworks of empires inform our research and our scholarship. Um, the thinking of people like Henri Jean-Louis transcended imperial boundaries. And so when we study colonialism and Atlantic world history, we should do the same. That's all. Thank you for, for listening. And thank you for coming out. Thanks, Phil. Uh, we'll open up the floor for questions now. So if you'll raise your hand, I'll acknowledge you and ask you to go, go ahead with your question or comment. You've stunned them into silence, Phil. Oh, there's somebody, okay. Um, Nancy, go ahead. Hold on. Okay, how's that? There you go, thank you. Okay, Phil, it's Nancy. Um, yes. I, uh, it's a really interesting archive and it's really interesting how you um, interpreted it. And um, I, I don't have any problems with your interpretation, but I, think in another scholar's hands there and and perhaps you're doing this elsewhere so I'm interested would be sort of more probing into his biography and what went on here to provoke some of these shifts in in poetry I mean clearly at some point he becomes a Muslim at some point he's there some of the poems are more intimate some of them are more about some of, some of the stuff is about aging almost. So I, I just wonder if there's enough in the archive for other lines of interpretation or if you, it's, you want to really keep to this one that's about geography and how the archive opens up for us a new way of thinking about um, how he, his imagination um, permitted a new way of imagining imperial spaces. I mean, he also moved. The mobility of this guy was quite extraordinary, I would think, for his period. So, which would again, would be on what I would call the more biographical track of, and so I don't know if there's other letters, if there's, you know, if, we, if you learn about his marriages and his children and his family. And so that's the question, if you can follow me. Yeah, absolutely. There's um, this idea of thinking about how his 
how his biography in particular, I think, his migrations, um, which are really remarkable. I've, I've given you a slice, you know, he was in Guadeloupe and then in Congo and then in Paris and then back and then in Trinidad and back around the Caribbean. He comes back and forth to Paris a lot, even later in his life. Um, and I, I sort of edited that out of the presentation today. Um, but there, there's not a ton of other information about his biography. Um, his, as I mentioned, his son, Victor, uh, became this quite acclaimed French novelist. He had a daughter who was quite a, an acclaimed musician in Paris, Moon de Rivelle. Um, you know, there's abundant information about them. Um, so there is more to say about how his, his movements, um, you know, influence his, his biography. As a civil servant, there's a ton of information uh, in colonial archives about uh, what he did as a lawyer and as a judge, uh -huh. some of his petitions and so on. He gets, uh, one of the reasons I mentioned he, he gets sent from Congo to Madagascar, but refuses to go. One of the reasons is because he's denouncing um, the French administration in Congo at the time. Um, so all these little details do absolutely I agree with you. Uh, these biographical things, and it's in particular the migrations and the networks, inform his, his thinking. Uh, for today, I sort of thought the re one reason why I really want to focus on this archive, this sort of finite archive in particular, uh, is the idea of form, which I didn't really get into more, um, but the idea of these very simple poems as a form in themselves, mm -hmm. uh, thinking about his use of that form mm -hmm. as a way of challenging the broader forms of empire. Mm -hmm. I th that for me, I, th I find that really uh, a fascinating thing in the chapter and pulling this from has a lot more with the biography, mm -hmm. but I, today I want to, I perhaps I didn't do enough uh, of thinking about the actual form of his poetry itself as a way of wrestling with the forms of colonialism. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff Nadell, you're up for a question. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, I enjoyed the presentation very much. Um, I also had a question that has to do with um, biography and geography. Um, and in many ways is a good follow up uh, for Nancy's question. Um, can you give us some idea of how much of his life was spent um, outside of the Caribbean? Yeah, um, so he's born, as I mentioned, 1874, and then he goes to Paris uh, around the turn of the century, and he's there for uh, six or seven years, I believe. I'd have to double check those dates. Um, and then he's back from France, back in the Caribbean. Uh, until 1923. But then there's a decade there from 23 until 33 where he's not in the Caribbean. And that's where he's partly in uh, Congo and he's circulating constantly in Gabon, um, in Senegal, in Cameroon, in France, and back and forth. Um, and to me, I, I tried to, I think I mentioned that briefly in the presentation, I see that period as really these networks that he created during that time as sowing the seeds for, for these later ideas uh, of making connections between people from all over the world in Paris, um, but also meeting other intellectuals in, in Central Africa. Um, there's, there's a lot, he has earlier writings, not necessarily poems in the same way from that period that give you a sense of how much those experiences shaped him. Um, but yeah, from, so from 23 to 33, he's not in the Caribbean. And then after 33, he's back um, he never returns to Africa after that point. Uh, he continues to go back and forth between um, Guadeloupe and Martinique. Uh, he's in Trinidad briefly there, and then he's in France a lot because his, part of his family ends up, his children end up in France. So he spends you know, three or four years at a time in Paris and then back in the Caribbean. Sort of. And then the last, I think the last six years of his life, from 52 to 58, he's uh, in Guadeloupe. Um, well, it's it's a it's a remarkable biography, and I can understand. Uh, Nancy may have different reasons for her um, interest in in the life, uh, but for me, the I deal a lot with biography in my own work. I, I can't help by being struck by the fact that 
but he's basically spending the last part of his life as a um, as a man without a base, um, except uh, between his ears. That is to say, the experience of uh, the first 50 years of his life, it seems to me, are 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 settled in, in a fairly prosaic way by somebody who's a part of the Caribbean elite, or the French Caribbean elite, and uh, seems settled for a very comfortable um, and rewarding life um, in the colonial system. And then his actual experience of the system after when he's in middle age uh, turns him around uh, rather dramatically. Uh, intellectually and politically and religiously. Um, it's not an easy move, I, I imagine, from Catholicism to Islam, uh, at least in those days. So um, I can't help but wonder um, what happened uh, to make him move so dramatically into such an extraordinary uh, trajectory where he's moving intellectually into a, a world of imagination which is strongly linked to issues and places of which he is not a part. It's an intriguing and exciting uh, biography in a way that I'm not accustomed uh, to seeing, at least with the people I work with. And I don't know how common it was among the um, French colonial elite of a similar um, background uh, to him. Uh, do you have any idea? Did he make a circle? Um, you mentioned, uh, uh, I think, Césaire. Did he make a circle of other intellectuals who were similarly um, uh, Pan-African, literally? Um, French Pan-African, I should say. Um, how much did he, did he make a lot of his political and intellectual contacts in the metropole itself. Um, I know that that was very significant in the interwar period um, among a number of uh, um, anti-colonialists throughout the world. How much of, of that was he a part of? How much of that moved him from where, what he had been uh, to what he became? That's a great question. Thanks, thanks for your comments, Jeff. Um, the, the first part of what, of what you were saying is this idea of, you know, what happened uh, to the point, you know, I, I started these poems in 1933, but as I mentioned, he's born in 1874. So he's, I'm not, I'm not a mathematician or a poet or a geographer, but um, that's over 50. Um, exactly. And this, and this dramatic shift, what, you know, what happened? Um, so, and then I'll get into the, the contacts and the metropole and the, and the circle you, you're asking about later. But first, this idea of what happened. Um, you know, I, I can't point to a specific moment uh, where something dramatic changed, but I can point to the, the larger project that I'm working on. Um, it is the experience of virtually everyone from the French Caribbean or the British Caribbean. Their ideas about going to Africa are partly informed by a very colonial imagination of going to Africa, of redeeming uh, backwards peoples in their, in their words. Um, but there's also a great essentialization of an African past, uh, this reconnection, uh, and that's the motivation for a lot of uh, Caribbean administrators like Jean-Louis to get these positions in Africa. But then what happens once they arrive uh, is they're in this profoundly, uh, profoundly impactful middle position where they clearly are not welcomed by their British and French peers. They see themselves as British and French, uh, but they are not considered as equals by their peers, nor are they considered uh, any different from the other perspective, from Africans. They see them as part of the colonial elite, part of the administration, no different, or sometimes worse. Uh, they see them as corrupted and turncoats, is sometimes the expressions that Africans use in newspapers to describe uh, these West Indian and Antillian administrators. And so when, it, when I've gotten in access to some of the personal accounts or personal letters uh, of Caribbean administrators like Jean-Louis, there's a real sense in the first uh, year or two years of their, their contracts, you know, the three or five year contracts 
working in different African colonies of not belonging, of not fitting, of not having a home, of not knowing. And the reaction to that is sometimes, you know, just going back to the Caribbean, taking your money, going back to your family and leaving. Um, but for some, and the more interesting stories that I can get a hold of, like Jean-Louis, there is this radical transformation uh, in rethinking ideas about their position in the world, their position in the French or British empires, and more generally, their ideas about uh, empire and colonialism. Um, so there is there, that experience of being in the middle, of not belonging, uh, really was powerful. Um, and I think for Jean-Louis, that was his experience too, his experiences of racism and discrimination um, in, in Central Africa in particular. Um, and then your, the second part of your question about did he have a circle or how did he make contacts? Certainly in, in Paris, he was a revered figure. Um, by the time he gets there in uh, the late 20s, um, there are all kinds of young students from, from different parts of Africa and different parts of the Caribbean and other parts of the world as well, um, who look up to him um, as someone who, you know, he had these ideas, he's a radical thinker who has spent his life, a lot of them had not, uh, from the Caribbean anyway, had not been to Africa. Their ideas about colonialism in Africa were, uh, they had no, there was no sense of it. Um, so here was someone who had been in all these different parts of the French empire, um, and they, you know, his name is an honorary president of a number of small associations. Um, he's his revered figure. Um, but in terms of a real, you know, building up an intellectual influence or a circle, that seems to fade. Um, and I'm not sure exactly why. Um, he really seems, you know, by the time he gets back to the Caribbean, as I said, he had a very hard time publishing anything. There are a few small things that he wrote, and he obviously wasn't he was continuing to write, his, his production just increases as he gets older, um, into his 70s and 80s. But for some, he had a few contacts. There's one doctor in Guadeloupe in particular that they write a few short manifestos uh, that are published. But he really seems to have lost um, influence. Uh, and I, that's, that's a one mystery from, from his biography that I don't know uh, entirely what happened yet. Um, why he wasn't able to maintain that, even though his ideas obviously maintained their, their power uh, throughout the, his lifetime till the end. Thanks for your question, Jeff. Thank you. Nancy, did you want to follow on that? I Otherwise... just would follow quickly to say, um, uh, it seems that most of these guys can't go home again is one thing. They don't go back for long periods to their own island or to their own um, home base. And, but I'm, and I'm also thinking of the parallel of Fanon. Fanon doesn't have as many stops, but he, you know, once he goes off for Paris, once he gets that education as a psychiatrist, lands in Algeria, of course he dies young, but he, um, uh, he stays away. I'm, I'm not sure how many times he goes back to Martinique. I don't know if that's in the helpful parallel, but it's, it is, I mean, he also goes very psychoanalytic in how he, he, he thinks about um, uh, colonial encounters and, and um, racism and stuff. So it's, anyway, I'll stop there. Yeah, they, they certainly, there's that same trajectory of, you know, it's, it's two generations later, um, from Jean-Louis to Césaire, you, you could yeah. say in the middle, and then to Fanon. Uh, but there is still this trajectory, you know, Fanon, the reason he left Martinique was to try and fight for the French in World War II, um, to get out of the, you know, Vichy government who's controlling Martinique and he right, had to get right. to, escape to try and fight for the French. And then, he, as you mentioned, this education, this experience in Algeria and this famous uh, resignation letter, um, you could probably draw, compar I hadn't thought about that directly, but I'm sure you could draw comparisons between mm -hmm. even that resignation letter that Fanon writes um, in Algeria and some of what Jean-Louis is writing at the exact same time in the, in the early 1950s. Um, there is that experience of once you have this, once you have this broader experience of what the French empire really was in these different parts, whether in the Caribbean or in France or in Africa, North Africa in Fanon's case or in Central Africa and in Jean-Louis case, what, it seems that once people get this broader sense, not everybody, but for many of the figures I'm studying and for Fanon too, when they get a broader sense of this empire, it's very hard for them, as you said, to go home, but it's also very hard for them to 
to go back into any kind of mold or form, if I can play with that word a little more, yeah. it was hard for them to get back into that form of accepting uh, some of these boundaries or geographies mm -hmm. of empire. Mm -hmm. All right, we have another question from Keeley. Yes. Um, well, first, let me just say that uh, I really enjoyed your lecture. Um, and it made me think of uh, the suitcase that I was gifted uh, from one of my cousins uh, for my great grandfather, who is a sort of, I'll say he's a, a more obscure Harlem Renaissance poet. Um, and he came from St. Kitts. Mm. And he's one of those that we were trying to figure out with some of the family that's in England and some of the family here, like why all those, you know, all of them, him and his brothers, why did they come at a certain uh, time? Uh, now he's, he's published, but um, his name is George Reginald Mogetson. And so, you know, he's, he's published, but the suitcase has all these poems that are you know, when I read them, um, they're colonial, they, you know, they're British, they're, you know, he talk. He, I haven't analyzed them yet. And so you've really given me sort of a, a way to sort of look at them. I hadn't thought about that. And it would be interesting to see because most of what we have, you know, we have photos and we have, you know, the papers and, you know, how his, one of his daughters started typing for him. And, uh, but it would be really interesting to sort of see how in the, his reasons to see if they could sort of parallel since you don't have as much information maybe on uh, the author, that you, the poet that you're looking at. But I, I really, it would be interesting to see, you know. Yeah, that's, that sounds like a fascinating comparison. Um, you know, when, whenever I've told this story before, you know, this, I mean, I wasn't, I, I sometimes like, I wish I could claim it as my own, that I was digging through this part storage apartment and found the suitcase myself. Uh, I wasn't there, it was this <laughs> literature scholar, Charles Scheele, um, so I'm not connected to it, and, it's, and certainly not. I don't have the you know direct connection of a of a grandfather, a great grandfather you mentioned, um, of his suitcase of all these old poems. Um, but there are, if you know, it's not the only. Whenever I've told that story, uh, people have invariably told me, "Oh, I have," you know, when I was doing research or a personal story, my grandmother or grandfather or some had this old tin trunk under their bed. No one knew anything about it. And then we pulled it out and this whole slice of this person's life that uh, we, don't, we couldn't quite understand. And now there's all this more rich detail to, to think about. Um, so I think you're right. There, there would be a, a very interesting uh, comparison to make between these sort of uh, tin trunk or suitcase histories, um, you know, what they contain and how you can analyze them uh, and what they tell you about migrations and, and the, the worlds that the suitcase owners uh, lived through, you know, even the idea of a suitcase, um, you know, why, why would you put your, all your poems into a suitcase? I suppose it's, you know, those old leather ones are fairly sturdy, but uh, the, the, the idea of a suitcase, you only use a suitcase when you're traveling. Um, so that alone, the idea of placing them into a suitcase, you know, you're always carrying these things around with you. It gestures to migration uh, mm -hmm. always, you know, that's, but thank you for that, bringing up that comparison. He didn't have as much, I mean, he went from St. Kitts and I believe he came to the United States when he was about 20. Mm. So that would have been late uh, 1800s, uh, mm. you know. So uh, uh, like I said, it would be interesting to go through and look at some of what he's written and sort of yeah. look at it from the eyes of what you see in uh, your history that you're looking at. So thank you yeah. so much. Thank you. Do you have any further questions or comments for Phil? Jeff, go ahead. I'll make it brief because I know people are probably anxious to begin their weekend. Um, but one thing that was very striking to me and, and must, I think many of us just take for granted now, um, but I'm not sure whether we should, has to do with the appeal of uh, the international communist movement in the interwar period and particularly a, a decision that they made, and I don't remember when this occurred, uh, but it's very important that they would make a, an appeal uh, to oppressed peoples within empires, including the former Russian empire. It was an appeal to various peoples that in the new world to be created after the revolution, 
they would be part of that new world and central to it and have their own world within it. And um, I think this, this is why it was such a strong appeal to um, people's, oppressed peoples um, all over the, the world. I'm thinking of um, the appeal to uh, African Americans in the United States, uh, some of whom turned to the left uh, where they were embraced, uh, something that wasn't happening elsewhere. And of course, um, we only need to think of uh, Fanon's title for his great work, The Wretched of the Earth. And um, it's clear that it, it was true for uh, this man as well, that they found an appeal which was directed explicitly at them for a struggle against the oppression of empire and colonialism and for a no, new world in which they would not be a part or without a country. Um, people in between, such as third world intellectuals um, in the interwar period, in between um, the past of their own peoples, their own countries, which could not be recreated, and a future uh, which was denied to them uh, by the uh, uh, colonial powers who had promised that they would be welcomed into civilization, but found when they became assimilated culturally that they're always held back uh, by their color uh, or some other uh, bar. Um, there was an enormous appeal, it must have been, to people who were so deracinated uh, both intellectually, politically, and um, in terms of their own backgrounds, their own peoples, their own cultures, the, the left must have had a tremendous uh, appeal along those lines, and it was a calculated one. Um, I don't know if this has been worked on uh, by other scholars, but it was something that was very clear to me years ago when I was um, much younger. Um, and I was wondering, has this been worked on? Is this something... Is there a body of scholarship which you can reach out to to try and understand that particular aspect of this man's work and appeal? Or is it something that we still have to uh, uh, create ourselves? Yeah, there, there is a, a, as you, you know, this question of the, the um, communist networks in interwar Europe uh, or around the world, but they, there is the where there is the biggest amount of scholarship is on these communist networks in Paris and London, um, right. and other kinds of networks too. But you, what you're asking about the you know the spread of Comintern and and communist agents around the world, Ho Chi Minh is in Paris at this time uh, for for a slightly earlier period, uh, but d certainly during the interwar period, Ho Chi Minh is there, uh, Jean Louis is there, and then a host of others. M. A. Césaire comes there later with Leopold Senghor. Um, Africans are, as well. Pardon me? Yeah, you mentioned Senghor. Africans yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and there are, for the French side, um, there are a number of books, in part because the French had, uh, were quite lit, had a ton of secret police uh, and collaborators who would spy on all these meetings and prepare nice orderly reports that you can read through. Um, so there's a lot to go on there. But in the last five, five or ten years, there have been a number of works on those interwar uh, metropolitan networks. What there hasn't been a lot of work on um, is in that same time period, there are similar kinds of networks being established in other parts of the world. And this is where my argument about geography, I think, I think is important um, because when you focus all this energy on looking at the networks of people coming from the, you know, the peripheries, the so-called peripheries to the metropole, um, you, you get a, a very rich history and the sources are there uh, for tracing these interwar networks, but you also get a history that kind of reproduces this geography of empire. Uh, and so what I'm trying to do with figures like Jean-Louis uh, and others is look at the networks that are created between Africa and the Caribbean, uh, which are different um, and have a different character. And they are not informed as much by this geography that is, that is so ground, so bounded by colonialism, uh, by, by the structure, the geography of empire. Um, so to me, that, that's where I can, I see my, you know, a place where, where my work uh, fills a gap. Uh, 
you know, there, there's, there's a lack, if that makes sense, there's a lack of thinking about this beyond that, that colonial geography. I look forward very much to reading it. I look forward to writing it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Phil, we have another question from Brenda Chelfin. Phil, this is such a fascinating talk and um, the whole matter of the geographic imagination and um, its political economy and its cultural economy, including it, um, the way it informs literature and the way it's represented in literature. So what this has gotten me to think about is the work of Amitav Ghosh. So in our quarantine, et cetera, I've been doing a lot of reading of Amitav Ghosh, who's an anthropologist turned author. Um, and he is really taken, I feel like most of his work really delves in to the lives of these middle figures and these cultures that span so many different locations. Um, it's not just about individuals, but they have a great deal of historical depth. Um, the crossing not only of kind of geographic and maritime and land boundaries, but the melding of different cultures and the, the borrowing. Um, but he mostly writes about an earlier period, um, you know, maybe 15th, 16th into um, mid 19th century. Um, I just read all about the Opium Wars, right? So that's mid 19th century. Um, his middle figures don't want um, any kind of bounded space. They don't want to recreate or claim kind of national space. So it's interesting to me that the person that you are writing about, that there's, he doesn't want an imperial space, but there is some sense of real kind of territorial integrity and even exclusion that's there for him. So I, I think Gauche could be very helpful in kind of recognizing some of the points of, of contrast um, and even thinking about um, kind of a different kind of spatial imagination that is more politically inflected versus that which is more economically inflected because so many of Gauche's characters and conflicts are all, they're much, they're about resources and they're about trade. Um, so I don't know if, if that's even a period that's um, as significant or of interest to you, but I'm, I'm just curious if, what that might inspire for you. Thank you, Brenda. Yeah, uh, it sounds like I'll have to uh, go to the library and get a, check out a few books. Um, I know I actually I haven't read any of his novels, uh, but I do know that he's, I, I once watched a talk uh, kind of like this, it was online, um, of a talk he gave, and it was him and uh, Natalie Davis, the historian, who's sort of known for her literary flair, her literary writing, and he of course is a novelist uh, famous for his historical research. Uh, so it was fascinating to watch them talk about historical writing, uh, you know, bound by the rules of of history or of a novelist. But in any case, I think your, your point about uh, geography and the idea of bounded space, um, and whether it be inclusive or exclusive in some cases, I think you're right, that would be a really good comparison because as much as I'm saying Jean-Louis is, is unforming um, the, the geographies of empire, there's only an extent to really that he is doing that because he does he does talk about um, creating an empire, the African empire. It's not always a republic, but even the idea of a republic of em or an empire of Africa, um, it's quite imperious. It's quite imperial in itself. It's drawing on Marcus Garvey's quite imperial ideas about Africa and about Africans. Um, and so, you know, as much as I'm saying and pushing and trying to make the case that he's not only reforming empire or deforming, he's moving beyond it, he's transcending these colonial geographies. I think there is a limit to how much I can make that argument with Jean-Louis. So I think it would be really interesting to trace some of these other 
maybe even more radical uh, ideas about space and geography that, that actually do go beyond, even from another period, uh, that really do stretch uh, beyond the form you know, of a bounded space or empire. So that, that sounds really like a helpful comparison. Thank you. Anyone else want to put their hand up for a comment or a question? Maybe Jeff was right and people do want to start their weekend. <laughs> oh, we have another question from Nancy. Go ahead, Nancy. Trying to get unmuted here. There, there we, we go. go. Sorry about that. Phil, I'm sure you know Simon Gikandi's book, The Maps of Englishness. And um, uh, do you know it? Do you know him and his book? I know his work. I have not read that book. Yeah. So, well, I mean, I just checked it out on Amazon again to see. Yeah. It's a very similar kind of thing, but it's it's all with, um, it's mostly white authors and um, it's, it's mo really highbrow, really highbrow and successful people that he's interpreting. So I think mm. what's unusual here is that you have this more, whatever, vernacular archive, this more archive, you know, this hidden archive and from an, an unrecognized person. And, um, but still I imagine you, you might want to confront how he, thinks about maps versus how you are thinking about maps is just a, a place to get some friction going that might help you clarify how your geography is. Is That book got a lot of play, a really, really lot of play in literary circles. So, and even in, in, in history circles. So yeah, it's just a suggestion for like other people have given of things to things to read. So I, the, the, for the Amitav Ghosh, I like In an Antique Land. It's an extraordinary book. If you're thinking about form, it's mm -hmm. how he it weaves ethnography and history and, and jumps across time periods. It's quite extraordinary book. So, um, but anyway, this has been great. It's a um, great set of comments from people and um, a, a, a wonderful paper. Thanks, Nancy. Okay, I'm going to uh, ask Brenda to close out the session uh, with a few words. Thanks for the talk and um, also for the interesting conversation. Before everyone takes off and um, we give our final thanks to Phil for sharing his work, um, I want to let everyone know that our annual research report ha is hot off the press. Um, our office isn't open um, for people to stop in, but we do have a pile of these in the hallway, in the mailboxes. Um, if you're not here on campus, please be in touch and we'll be able to mail this to you. Um, but it really presents an overview of the work of both our faculty, grad students, undergrads, even the book that um, Nancy Hunt just mentioned is discussed by uh, Montalola Adeojo. It's something that informs her work in literature. So, it will just alert you to all of the ongoing um, conversations that we're having here at the center. And it will also remind you in some ways of the better times when we could really share in person. So um, thank you again to Dr. Jansen for sharing your work. Thanks to everyone in the audience and um, have a wonderful weekend. <laughs>